Hello, I'm Professor Thompson, and this is the first video lecture on Chapter 49, Hazardous Materials. There's going to be five uh, short videos on this chapter, and this is the first one, the introduction. Uh, hazardous material, any substance or material capable of posing an unreasonable risk to health, safety, or the environment when transported, used incorrectly, or not properly contained or stored. Okay, that's a pretty general uh, definition. Uh, our civilization requires manufacturing, transporting, storing, using, and disposing of tens of thousands of potentially harmful substance, substances Excuse me, each year. Operating at a hazardous material scene presents challenges that you don't normally encounter during a normal EMS call. There's the potential for you to be exposed to a toxic substance and turn into a victim, and handling exposures properly and with confidence is an important task for the paramedic. <clears throat> Regulations and standards. Uh, regulations for responding to hazardous materials incidences are created by the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is OSHA, and the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency, which is the EPA. HAZWOPER, which is Hazardous Waste Operations and Emergency Response, uh, is the OSHA document that actually outlines the hazardous materials uh, response competencies. So they have HAZWOPER courses uh, in different localities. A lot of times you'll see them at the Emergency Operations Center. They have the HAZWOPER course, and that's exactly what it's uh, about. It goes over the uh, HAZWOPER manual and the response to hazardous materials. You have different training levels, and this is where you get your hazmat teams. The awareness level is kind of like what you're doing now. It's uh, basically the level for any first responder. You get an awareness level on what hazmat uh, is, the how to use the emergency response guide, and that's pretty much the extent of it. You're gonna stay in you know your uh, cold area, cold zone uh, operations, and stay as far away, pretty much, from the hazardous material as possible. The rule of thumb, no pun intended, is to try to cover the scene with your thumb. If you can't cover it with your thumb, you're too close when you first arrive on scene of a possible hazmat. The operations level will uh, allow you to do that. just that. You operate as at a hazardous material scene, but not necessarily to the, the level of a technician, which is somebody who gets into the warmer and to, into the hot zones. Uh, your specialists are going to be people that have done extensive levels of training on hazardous materials, and they, they are very good at identifying uh, and managing hazardous material scenes. And then your incident commander isn't necessarily trained to a higher level in hazardous materials, but they're the commander of any scene uh, in this case would be a hazmat scene. Regulations and standards continuing on. Uh, awareness level should be able to do the following. Understand what hazardous substances are. Understand potential outcomes. Recognize the presence of hazardous substances. Uh, identify hazardous substances. Uh, understand his or her role in the response plan. And determine the need for additional resources. Again, this is the very basic level of training. When on scene of an incident, you must rely on training and reference uh, sources. Here you see the ERG, which is the Emergency Response Guidebook. Uh, you'll find this in pretty much every ambulance, probably in on every fire engine as well. Um, this provides you with a lot of information. Uh, there's another video within this module that kind of goes over the use of the ERG as well. So you want to familiarize yourself with the following the different types of personal protective equipment, how patients will be de decontaminated, and how to assess and treat different exposures. Hazmat incidents uh, may include a highway or rail incident in which a substance is leaking from a tank or a car, a leak or rupture of an underground natural gas pipe, buildup of methane or other byproducts in sewers, sewage plants, and or landfills. A lot of times these calls just come in as a strange odor or potential leak or spill, uh, you know, and a lot of times you don't know what the material is until a few steps into the into the call because your first response uh, isn't going to be to arrive on scene of a hazardous material and get in on the scene, you know, and, and get in there and try to identify what it is. You're going to, again, try to use that rule of thumb. You want to try to 
make sure that whatever this place is is evacuated but from afar uh, and then once your operators and your technicians arrive on scene they can generally get in there and identify what the hazardous material is so your scene size up is critical when it comes to hazmat calls uh, you want to make sure at all times your first priority is ensuring your own safety uh, especially in the presence of hazardous materials. It may not be possible to identify what the haz hazards are present. Uh, warning signs include the following. Signs and symptoms of patients on the scene. If you have several people that have the same symptoms, especially respiratory ailments, um, nausea, vomiting, or, or anything like that, you got to consider a possible hazardous material exposure. Uh, placards and labels found on Buildings, trucks, drums, or storage vessels can all be good indications or indicators of what type of hazardous material you're dealing with. So just think, scene size up, you arrive on scene of something like this uh, shown on the slide, what are you going to do? What's going through your head? Yeah, you may be well into a call before you have a firm grasp of what's happening. Um, so you may be on scene of a car accident, and then you start seeing you know, something like this come up out of a big tank or something you this may be happening before you get there and then you see something like this uh, and, and you can't identify from this angle what's going on maybe the placards here you know in, somewhere in this gas smoke and you can't see what it is okay you may be able to identify leaks and spills by this kind of thing a visible cloud a leak or spill from a tank container truck or a railroad car unusual strong noxious uh, odors things like that uh, so if you can identify that, again, use that rule of thumb, get far away from this because this could be some bad stuff uh, and, and cause some serious uh, ailments. So again, you should suspect the presence of haz hazardous materials if you approach a scene where more than one person has collapsed, is unconscious, or is in respiratory distress. Anytime you have a call that comes in and there's more than one person in the same facility or place that has uh the same type of symptoms then you need to start considering the po potential for a hazardous material incident so you're seeing size up if you're responding to what i just said and you're responding and you hear several people inside an office building are, are complaining of respiratory distress your response back to you know the dispatcher if, if you're the you know main unit or the first unit uh, responding is to hopefully get that place evacuated, right? Because if the the hazmat is in the office building and they're constantly being exposed to it, that's not good. Maybe if they evacuate and leave the doors and windows open on their way out, they can air it out at the same time. They can get themselves some fresh air and hopefully start the uh, healing process, if you will. Proper safety measures during a hazardous material incident. Uh, this this includes for for the awareness level stay far away that's your proper safety measure make sure the hazmat team's been dispatched uh, of course the fire department will do that as well uh, and keep your distance and stay in the cold zone uh, there will be times when your ambulance crew is the first to respond if you notice any signs that suggest hazardous material incident uh, has occurred stop at a safe distance upwind and uphill from the scene again the rule of thumb once you rapidly size up the scene, isolate the hazards, uh, hazardous area the best that you can. Uh, when you get there, and even on your way to a call, if you already are thinking that this is a potential hazardous uh, material incident, try to get the wind direction, and this is something you can re request from dispatch. Um, and then as you're getting there, I mean, luckily in the state of Florida, it's pretty flat, especially down in, in southwest Florida. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the uphill component, but if you if you were working somewhere where you did, make sure you stay uh, uphill and up up upwind. Deny entry to any affected area once you've arrived on scene far enough away, uh, and you consider it a possible hazmat as as other cars are, or people approach. Make sure you keep them from going in there. Call for your additional resources. Once your safety is ensured, you may begin the process of identifying victims and beginning patient care. And this is going to be as they come, you know, out towards you or as they're being deconned by the, the fire department or hazmat team. If you do not recognize the danger until you are too close, leave the danger zone immediately. So if you get on scene and then you start smelling something bad, get out of that scene. 
So you're seeing size up, continuing on. Provide as much information as possible when calling for additional resources. Your exact location, the atmospheric conditions if appropriate, the size and shape container or cargo tankers, the exact name of the substance if you know it from looking it up in the ERG, or the chemical ID number or symbols if you can't find the ERG. Um, that's how the, somebody else would look it up. The number of victims, this is your MCI stuff. You want to make sure you triage appropriately. Include signs and symptoms that you observe, uh, the type and number of additional resources that you need, the location of safe staging areas for incoming resources, because remember calls like this, you get a lot of people and you don't want to you know, clog up your egress. Uh, the location of the incident command post. So if you're first on scene, you are the incident commander um, and you know, announce where your post is. So if somebody is to arrive on scene and join you in a unified command situation or to relieve you of command, then you, they know where to go for a face-to-face -face handover. Uh, don't re-enter or leave the hazardous area until a hazardous material team clears you. That doesn't mean get don't get out into a cold zone. If you go into a building and you start smelling something noxious, uh, get out of that building, but you can't, you know, you're not relieved from the scene until cleared by a hazmat team, meaning you can't clear the call, so to speak. And remember, information on these calls comes from many different places, observations, reports from bystanders, signs and symptoms of the victims, labels and placards, shipping papers, uh, MDS sheets, all of those are, are good resources for information uh, to identify that hazardous material that you're, you're trying to figure out what's going on and the different signs and symptoms it could cause, the type of decontamination that needs to be done, all that stuff can be found in the ERG. Decontamination and treatment, you cannot immediately begin care until you fully understand the situation. Okay, so c caring for somebody that's been exposed uh, to hazardous material could cause you um, some sort of uh, exposure. So you want to make sure that they're decontaminated uh, before they get treated. Decontamination is the highest priority when a substance provides an unacceptable risk to responders. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That doesn't just mean you. Think about this hazardous material patient that you and where are you taking them? To a hospital. You do not want to cause a situation at a hospital where you're putting other people at risk. Patients uh, must be decontaminated before they are given treatment. And you should try to decontaminate them before you get them into your ambulance because you don't want to contaminate your ambulance. Uh, it, that's a whole nother process and a whole nother level of, the, of a call that you don't want to get to. So um, that's it for this first video. Uh, this was just kind of your introduction, and we'll continue on in the second hazmat video lecture.